Okay, so this is going to be a lesson on chapter 16, section 1, on Darwin's voyage of discovery. So you've got your student notes that are posted at Canvas. This is a graded assignment, and um, this presentation is going to go over those notes for you. So uh, Charles Darwin um, was born in 1809 in England to a, a religious family, and it was a time in history where people were um, quite religious in the sense that uh, they took the Bible literally, and, and so it's just the culture and the belief system. For example, that God created the earth in, uh, or in the universe in seven days, and God created everything to his design, which obviously we believe today. But when you look at the Catholic faith today, uh, there is what is called an encyclical, which is the church's official teaching on this, um, that uh, we now believe that evolution and um, the natural forces that we are all subjected to living on the earth you know, with the laws of gravity, uh, with uh, scarcity or with uh, calamity and um, just survival of the fittest and being able to grow your own food and everything. You know, we, we understand that God created the mechanisms that we all live by, but this was not the case back in the day. It was just all um, very religious uh, with the Bible's teaching um, and we now know that the, that the Bible is full of figurative stories, too. Jesus was quite a parable storyteller. And uh, so some of the stories in the Bible are not to be taken literally, but they're a, a figurative story. And we learn lessons from them. So Charles Darwin did not intend on being a scientist. He wasn't a star student. But it's kind of funny how things work out sometimes. God had a plan for him, and now he came up with one of the most important scientific theories of all time, and that is the theory of evolution. So he has a huge contribution to science. So as I explained, um, he, even on his journey, uh, when he was on the ship, he wasn't trying to come up with anything. He was only 22 years old. And he was assigned the duty of collecting plants and animals on this journey, as you saw in the video. Charles um, Darwin, Darwin's dangerous idea, uh, because when he started to develop this idea after his return on a five-year voyage, he uh, it, it took him a while to come up with the evidence to really feel as a 27 year old that you know he could tell people that hey you know things are different than what you guys believe so he took a long time to develop this scientific theory of evolution that explains how both plants and animals can change over long periods of time we've gone over the mechanism of how cells make copies of themselves in the process of mitosis or even meiosis and we know that there can be errors in the copying process and some of these errors and most of these errors do not make a big deal for an organism it just means that they're different than their than their uh, parents so we know the mechanisms of crossing over where the homologous chromosomes are going to exchange bits and pieces of it or maybe there's a spelling error when it's doing replication and this is where you get changes which may in effect give an advantage to an animal and, and so that's what it means by um, what we're going to be talking about here with survival of the fittest so i've alluded to his epic journey you've seen this and uh, this, this really shaped his life. He did not want to go into the religious order and become a priest. So at the beginning of the video, 
the captain of the ship called the HMS Beagle. The captain was very religious, and so he would have arguments with Charles Darwin about, like, what kind of a preacher are you going to be if you, if you uh, look at nature as like an accident or that people just survive and, 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 and toil through and pass on their offspring? And at the beginning of the video, Darwin said, you know, I, I think I'm going to be a pretty horrible um, preacher. So he did not want to go back to England after this journey and become um, a, a pastor like his family wanted him to be. So he grew up in a time, like I mentioned, when the scientific view of the world was shifting dramatically and no one really wanted to change their thinking. So that's why the video is called Darwin's Dangerous Idea. This was also the time in the early 1800s where geologists were suggesting that the earth was ancient instead of very young. And biologists were also suggesting that life on earth changes over time. No one really took a close look at observing animals and even plants. Uh, imagine a plant trying to grow up underneath a giant oak tree and now it is struggling to get enough sunlight in order for its leaves to go through photosynthesis. So they weren't looking at things like that. So the process of change over time, that word is called evolution. And he developed this scientific theory. He's not the only one who came up with the theory, but he's the one that got it started in 1831 as a 22-year-old collecting evidence. There were others that also were working uh, through this. And so uh, Darwin wasn't the first to publish, but he had the most um, data collection. And it was just such a, scientific breakthrough on his entire work. Um, ships even to this day are called HMS. They have these initials in the front of it. I looked it up the other day. It stands for His or Her uh, Majesty's Ship. So when the government, like England, owns a ship, they put their initials, His Majesty Ship. And this was called the Beagle. Could you imagine as a 22-year-old, like right after college, just telling your parents, uh, um, I'm going to set out on this job here and I'm going to be traveling the world. And uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to come back. You know what? I'm not even sure if I'm going to come back because we could get shipwrecked. Take a look at, at their voyage that they have in this picture. Um, I think I can zoom in on it. So they start up there at the top in Europe, over in England. They sail down past Africa and they go to the east coast of South America, travel around the Cape Horn, all the way up to the west coast of South uh, America. And then they travel across the Atlant no, the Pacific. And uh, they head over toward uh, New Zealand, Australia, then they go to the other coast of Australia and then they head back over to Africa and then back over to South America and back up to Europe and, and to England. So took a long time with no engines just to sail, um, sail the winds. And they were looking for trade routes. They are looking for finding things that would be valuable and bring back to England. And, and uh, at the time, they did not call science people, science people or biologists, they called them naturalists because they would understand what was valuable in nature. And that would be plants and animals that they could use um, for specimens to, to grow crops, uh, animals to domesticate, things like that. Um, no one knew that Charles Darwin's role on the ship would be the most important. And it, it's just the way things work out sometimes. So uh, 
Darwin brought back a lot of specimens. He thought that he could bring back live animals. He had a very small cramped space. If any of you guys have been down to Dana Point uh, with the Pilgrim, uh, they had programs for elementary school kids to s spend some time, like an overnight camping on the Pilgrim. And then you get a sense for what life would be like on a sailing ship. Very tight quarters. Darwin had a very small section of the ship to try to keep his specimens. Have you ever been seasick? Darwin was not a seagoing person. I don't know why he took this job. Maybe to get away from his uh, perceived route to become a religious man. But uh, he hated it. He got seasick. So he loved his time on land collecting specimens. In the video, you get a sense for even the captain of the ship and Darwin going out together and collecting fossils, talking to the natives, things like that. So here is what Darwin observed, not necessarily codified like this, written down like, hey, this is what I'm intending on doing. This, this is what he noted on his five-year journey. Collected fossil evidence. Sometimes they were extinct. And uh, examining them, comparing them to living species. So now he's seeing how they may have changed over time. He noted that things were different in different continents. So that's number two. They're different, but they're similar to animals that were on other continents. So globally, habitats are similar around the globe, and he noticed that animals were different yet similar. And then number three, when he was like in Argentina in certain spots or the Galapagos Islands, some animals were, were similar, but they're different. They're different species, but very similar. Uh, within a local area. So how could that happen? And, and so he collected a lot of specimens. He filled his notebook with observations. I thought it was interesting watching the video uh, that he did not categorize his uh, birds called finches from the Galapagos Islands. By islands, there were something like 13 islands. The captain of the ship did. So the captain was doing his own collection. And so Darwin had to get the captain's collection as well to try to uh, fill in the blanks from his notes on the ship. And he was a very detailed person. He looked for large patterns into observations, which other people were not doing at the time. And so as he traveled uh, one, two, and three again, he noticed that species vary globally, locally, and over time with the fossil evidence. So we're going to go over those three, go over a few examples. So number one, he noted around the globe that there were examples of like flightless birds called rheas, similar to the ostrich, and also in Australia, the emu. All these birds are huge, and uh, they once had the ability to fly, but they have evolved into a very large size where they're not going to be able to have flight. And so that's one thing that he noticed. Also noticed that there were um, similar like grassland animals. We are very familiar with rabbits. The same thing over in Europe. But over in South America and Australia... Um, there's other species besides rabbits. In Australia, there's kangaroos. And uh, these are very similar geographic areas when you look at where they are on what is called the latitude, how far they are north and south of the equator, and how similar the rain patterns are and, and the geography. But the animals are different. Then, as I mentioned, uh, he noticed that species vary locally as well. And, and these are two very similar animals. They look like an ostrich. They're called a rhea. 
They're in the grasslands in Argentina. The one on the left is in more of a desert grassland. The one on the right more in a uh, tropical uh, grassland. And, and so that is a good example of these two would not be able to produce fertile offspring together. They're two separate species. In, in an upcoming lesson, we're going to talk about what is a species. And, and uh, simply, they're not able to have viable offspring. Then we're going to talk about how uh, speciation can occur. That's really interesting. He also looked at uh, tortoises. And here we are in the Galapagos Islands. He noticed differences in rocky um, islands. You can see that in this picture, uh, Isabella, uh, you can see that it's got some mountains and uh, it's got hard places to to uh, even navigate. So the, the tortoise is going to have longer legs, longer neck, reaching higher up vegetation, uh, things like that. Based on the geography, the, uh, the tortoise's shells are drastically different. And he brought specimens back uh, of these guys. So on this slide, it talks about how the vegetation is close to the ground, if it's rocks. And if it is a dry desert-like, then there's not going to be much vegetation on the ground. So these tortoises have responded over time. So there, there must have been some mutations. And the ones that were the oddballs and had something different, they could outcompete the regular tortoises. And Hood Island, flat, dry, sparse vegetation. And so if you were able to have longer legs, longer necks, you could stretch to these higher areas. And so this is something that he took notes on, brought these specimens back. And the finches right here and his bird collection is really kind of what made, made him famous. And so this is a brown bird on islands with different beak shapes. So you can see some have longer, more delicate beaks in the center. On the right, some have very thick beaks that could crack through harder nuts and seeds and get at the seeds. Some are just picking off insects like on the left. So they're in different habitats. And he thought that sometimes these were all the same bird. He uh, brought these back and an ornithologist, somebody who studies birds, said, no, these are different species, and he was quite surprised. He collected fossil evidence, and he explained these back to the scientific community. You saw that in the video, and the video really brings all this to, to life. It's really interesting to see not only the reaction that people had to his specimens because they were so foreign. No one had ever seen these before. But he had to uh, talk about how these were related and have evolved over time. And, and, and so he started to do a lot of lectures. And you saw in the video how his brother would he would practice his lectures on his brother and he would let go, uh, what was their reaction and how did you do it and what was it like? So it was really a great glimpse into how the scientific community has big moments of change in the way of thinking. So putting the pieces together wasn't quick. You would think like he would come back from his voyage after after five years and just be ready to publish a book and everything. So he got back from his journey when he was 27 years old in 1836. And it took him another 27 years to publish the book. He was very hesitant. And you got that in the video. 
because he did not want to be made fun of. This was going against the greatest thinkers of the time in the uh, universities and in, in the royal societies. And, and so he kind of had to earn his keep. He really wanted to make sure his job was done well so that there would be no doubt. Even his wife, Emma, was saying, you've got to publish a book. Other people are going to beat you to it because there were a couple others now that he was reading a newspaper and the video is like, oh my gosh, he's, it's like he stole my work. Um, but that was just a synopsis of work. It wasn't Darwin's complete collection. So then his health started to fail. He's nearing 50 years old and he realizes that He's got to get this done. What if he died? He told his wife, if I die before this is done, you have to publish it. And his wife's like, just publish the book. So in 1859, he did. And it was called The Origin of Species. He didn't talk about human evolution in there. He tried to keep religion out of it and, and, and so that he could have a purely scientific study on his life's work. And to wrap it up, he also looked at mockingbirds. He looked at the iguanas, brought back plants as well. And he really focused in on the natural process, and it's called survival of the fittest. We're going to be looking closer into it, but in this lecture, it really focused in on Darwin, his life, his struggles with going against society. That's why it was called Darwin's Dangerous Idea for that really great video. So fill in the missing blanks in this notes. You are also to watch this video. It should work just by clicking in Galapagos Finch Evolution. There is a couple called the Grants. They're two science people as well. And in the 1900s, they went back to the Galapagos Islands looked at the finches, tried to see if evolution could happen on a, on a quick scale because these islands are a couple hundred miles off the coast of uh, South America and they go through droughts of rainy season and dry seasons and they noticed that you can see evolution happen on a pretty quick scale. So watch the video Take notes on this page about what they're noticing, as I was alluding to right here. And then there are some questions for you to answer uh, as well. Um, I zoomed to pass them, but uh, five questions to answer. Those questions are in the textbook. You can answer those probably right here from this note, but if you check out the chapter 16, section 1, you will be able to answer those questions. Turn it all in as one PDF file that's, that's due at Canvas. So there you have it. Have a great day. And now when you go outside, take a look at, at uh, plants and uh, animals scurrying around and realize that they're having to compete in nature. And if they can't compete, they're not going to be passing on their genetics. And that's what survival of the fittest is. Collecting food, finding a habitat, being able to... Find food yourself, not, not be someone else's meal, pass on your genes, and then try to get your offspring to survive. And that's what Darwin noticed on his journey. So have a great day on your journey today, and I will see you soon.